<laughs> and if that's what you want, that's what you want. Yeah, exactly. This is where I live and that's the end of it, you know? <laughs> But so the podcast, as you discovered when you listened to it, is called Get Your Fill Financial Independence and Long Life. So I thought that we could talk about the financial independence piece of it, but you're welcome. I'm to all talk about for it. the long life, too. All right. Well, let's talk about anything. I act retired now. That's how you. <laughs> You increase your lifespan. Exactly. Well, I have I have some good books to recommend now that I think about it. I should have thought about it earlier so I could show you the cover. But I read a book called Ikigai. I-K-I-G-A-I. You may like that. But oh, it's about, you heard about it? Well, I think your mom talks about it when I interviewed her. I think there's a link. Oh, but yeah. I'll, I'll put a she link. She got it from me. Yeah, I, I'll put a link to it on the on the. Um, website which is getyourfillpodcast.com and then you can just click on it and buy it right then Easy. yeah yeah so if you guys about um basically a study or i should say tapping into the secret of um why the japanese live so long yeah what are their habits um what is their i guess life philosophy what are their routines? What is their perspective? And I've learned a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, for one, it mentions about a certain flow. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting concept because I think the culture we live in, we strive for a certain progress, mm -hmm. whereas they strive for a certain rhythm. Oh, yeah. So it is not shameful to be in one position for 30, 45 years. And one of the reasons that they are okay with being in a position that long is because they really own that position and they're literally in the flow of that position, you know, as opposed to. I think sometimes for us, a lot of things are just stair steps. Yeah. You know, we, we, we don't like politicians that we feel like are only running for this position for the next position. Right. Um, and then sometimes, you know, depending on what type of career ladder we're trying to climb, we can kind of just take this job just to prepare us for the next job, for the next thing. Right. So that's yeah. one. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, and then um, a certain diet was uh, another one. Um, certain exercise and movement was another one. Yeah, and connection and community was also an you know a, another big one, not to be under understated. Yeah. Well, that's <coughs> where you know we we sort of a lot of us have got away from community, you know, and we just like well we don't we don't have time for that, you know we don't. Mm. You know, and, and it, you know, you don't know your neighbors, whatever, but there's a lot of support that comes from that and a lot of, you know, positive energy and, you know, just a lack of stress, you know, less stress that you know that you can rely on your neighbors and, and, and loneliness. I mean, I think a lot of us, a lot of people in the United States, I think are lonely. You feel that way? Yeah. Um, a lot of times loneliness starts in the mind, though. It's always in the mind, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> because even in the presence of someone else, yeah, depending on how we're thinking about that person, we separate from them. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Because we have to, you have to open <clears throat> yourself up in order to get that connection. So, or be, and, and, or be willing to see something or someone in a different way. Yeah. I live at home with my parents, so I mean, I had to do that if I was going to move back home and survive. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I moved back in with my parents for a little while, and I thought to myself, why did I ever leave? You know, my mom was like making my dinner and making me little lunches, and I thought, geez, what was I thinking? Why did I move out of here? <laughs> Ready to be an adult? No. Over, overrated, <laughs> let me tell you. I know, but you know, it's also, um, 
part of it is, um, you know, it's, it would be easier to live at home uh, depending on like the privacy that you have, the size of the home, things like that. You know, we, when I, when I moved back in with them, you know, they had a, you know, small ranch and it's okay. You know what I mean? But there's no public space that isn't, you know, there's like one living room, one kitchen, you know, there's no place to go except your bedroom to be away from everybody. And, you know, you kind of need a little bit more, you know, I need, I would need like a girl cave or what do you, what do you call it? What do they call it? Girl? Yeah. A girl, a girl cave. Yeah. <laughs> a girl cave. A girl den. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're right. You're definitely right. And I think that's why some people can't stay at home. Yeah. Um, I know I, I was also mindful of that. But I can't admit that I don't want my privacy more than the luxuries afforded to me right now. So. <laughs> it's a small price to pay. <laughs> and I willingly pay them, okay? If I need that much privacy, I can walk out that house and do whatever else I need to do and come back. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that was actually one of the problems too is now that I'm thinking about it is lifestyle because I would, you know, I would come home late and always have to be tiptoeing around and, you know, being afraid of waking them up and stuff like that. So that was a problem. But yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, you were, you made the right decision for you. <laughs> you had big dreams and goals in life, Chris. I had to live in a house with no friggin' walls for a very long time. That's why I left home now. <laughs> I, I'm just like near peas and potatoes. I don't, I, I don't, I'm dreaming that big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you never know. It, that is the funny part <clears throat> that um, I do feel more about life. Like I've made plans and not to say I don't still make plans. I do. But, um, Sometimes you just don't know. Or sometimes something comes up and it's it's a different plan, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I did, that happened when I was in D.C. Like at the time, I was like, oh, I could, I could do this for the rest of my life. What were you doing in D.C.? I was a gardener. Oh, yeah? And I had a contract uh, with Howard University and I was teaching. Yeah. So why DC? What brought you there? Uh, I graduated from Howard. Oh, you did? Oh, so okay. I went to school there for four years, and then I stayed for four years after graduating, gardening and teaching, investing, actually. <laughs> um, Are you yeah, taught investing? I, yeah, I, I, I taught uh, preschoolers first, because um, I, I just love like three, four, five-year-olds. And then... I did that for a year, and then the the last three years, um, I taught middle school girls investing. So, how do you teach a, a young kid like that? How do you teach a four year old kid how to? How, oh, concept? I wasn't teaching them investing. Oh, you weren't. Okay. No, no, no. I was just teaching. You know, like teachers aid, like ABCs, yeah. one, two, threes, like that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like that age group, so that's why I did it. Yeah, they're adorable at that age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wanted to try out, you know, did I want to be a teacher? Did I want to be in education administration? Yeah. So <clears throat> I did that. It, and it was fun. But I realized that, um, yeah, I probably couldn't do it for as long as I thought I was. <laughs> it, it's, it's a di I didn't realize how much I was used to a certain level of adult interaction <laughs> and mental stimulation, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when you're around babies yeah. all day, it can be a little basic. Yeah. But it's all good. Well, because it's all, it's pretty much all one way. <clears throat> you know, they're giving you something, but they're not giving you stimulation. You know, you're just stimulating them and then you're just like, you know, dumbing down sort of. It. yeah it was it's a lot of it's a lot of dumbing down yeah but it's it was very interesting because they were 
very little people, you know. <laughs> I think, um, <clears throat> what's the name of that show? I forget the name of the show, but this guy calls children little people. Like, <laughs> they're little people. But anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, I forget. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I could really tell who their parents were. Like, in the beginning, yeah. If I saw them and then I saw who was picking them up, it was like, oh. Or sometimes I would try to guess the parent would come to the door and I'd be like, are you here for such and such? Oh, really? You know? <laughs> Man, carbon copies. Yeah. <laughs> Just the other day, last weekend, my niece she kept using her hand like this right and i was like where are you getting that from and lo and behold i caught myself doing it i saw my dad doing it <laughs> i was like oh my gosh it's genetic <laughs> <laughs> like just like constantly making mashed potatoes i mean it's just it was it was just like a, a ferris wheel <laughs> yeah so so yeah it, it's it, it is kind of cute though you know never blame your kids always blame you yeah well, i don't have kids so i don't have to worry about no that. not you i'm talking to the audience yeah exactly it's, it's all whatever it is it's your fault so. <laughs> never the, it's never the kids fault they're just nope, showing exactly. you something you 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 didn't pick up on yourself yet Right. Something that you don't like about your kids is something that you haven't quite <laughs> got around to changing about yourself yet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when you were, I know, I know a lot about your story of how mm. you sort of got into investing, but mm. why don't you tell everyone else? That, oh, I like how you put that. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews recently. Mm-hmm. And each time I do one, it makes me realize what I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> you should phrase that differently. Let them know this. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like I tell one insight, but I didn't tell the other insight. Yeah. Or I say it one way and I've left it up into, I left it up for interpretation. But sometimes I think sometimes people take it a little wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, or take it in a way I don't understand. And you can't always prevent that. But um, <clears throat> so my story begins with, like we said about the three, four, five year olds, <laughs> my story began with my, my mother. It also began with my father <clears throat> because, well, it really began with my grandmother um, <laughs> because we're going all the way back. Uh, when I was, actually three, four, and five, yep. um, up until I actually graduated kindergarten when I was five, <clears throat> excuse me, I lived with my grandmother, my mother's mother. And I, you know, I have the memories, I have the house, I know where it is. My, my uncle, uh, my mother's brother doesn't live too far from the house. And um, I remember, you know, it's fond memories. <clears throat> but about like seven, I remember, um, you know, moving with my mother and, um, and watching her go through this thing called probate, you know, for my oh. grandmother's house. Yeah. And so in watching her go through that process, you know, well, you know, my mom, she's very transparent about the process <laughs> she goes through. So she's always been like that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> although she was a, budding entrepreneur at the time or successful um, entrepreneur at the time this probate process really opened her eyes to the other side of um, assets and finances that she did not know about money the world of money that she did not know about and um, we ended up losing my grandmother's house but she ended up um, taking it as a big learning lesson and, and, um, and admitting how much she didn't know. 
yeah. and started to read books and get connected with organizations so that she could then educate herself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, at the elementary school, to middle school, and I always, you know, was with my mother. And, um, and being alongside of her and being a kid, I was engaged. I think my mother helped me stay engaged. She never let me just be a child that just played and, you know, and, and wasn't <laughs> aware of, you know, what, what, what was around me or what she was being involved in. <clears throat> so um, consequently, I began to pick, pick up certain lessons quicker than her. Um, which then allowed her to start relying on me for certain <laughs> lessons. And so it just became ended. this, <laughs> exactly. It just became this <laughs> never ending um, reinforcement loop of, I only figure this out. I only come <laughs> teach me that. I only please help me figure this out. And, um, and, you know, in a sense, at the time, it was definitely joyful to be able to help my mom. And <clears throat> and I was a kid, so learning was still fun. I mean, learning is still fun for me now. I mean, I work at a damn library. So. <laughs> um, but I will say it was, it was probably one of the greatest things. You know, you kind of look at what the, um, what's that thing in the thing or rich book? Something in the fire or... The, the something that you find in the rubble after the fire oh yeah yeah <clears throat> I forget almost like a diamond in the rough yeah yeah but um yeah so at an early age and I always liked math I mean I always liked a lot of subjects but I always liked math and the reason I also bring my dad into it is because when I would go shopping with my dad we always bought stuff on sale but he always had me calculate what the sale was before we got to the register. <laughs> so I remember being in Burdines or Macy's <clears throat> and JC Penney and seeing a uh, 50% off with an additional 25% off and literally <laughs> having to do that calculation. <laughs> um, and just, you know, in, in, in everyday life situations, getting familiar and comfortable with numbers with math with money and how it works yeah um and how it really works you know um why pay full price for something right when you could wait a little longer and allow it to go off season especially if you don't need it and you know save more money because you bought that for less <clears throat> um and when i started going to better investing um, classes i was very supported and encouraged by everybody that saw me and their recurring theme to me or i should say uh words of wisdom to me was um if i had only started when i was your age yes <laughs> and i'm looking at them like but you look good right now. I mean, what, how old did you start? Yeah. And they would tell me they started at 25 or they started at 30 and now they're 50 and retired or they're 60 and retired. And I remember this one lady very vividly. She was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm retired now. So I'm going to do this uh Alaskan cruise with my grandkids and this Caribbean cruise with my grandkids. <laughs> like, this is basically cruising around the world with her grandkids. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. It was, it was a very different world. Well, I mean, you know this <clears throat> because you've been exposed to the world of real estate brokers. Mm -hmm. And then you've probably also been exposed to the world of, um, other types of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and you've been exposed to the world of professional speakers and you can literally see like the differences in the people the you know the lifestyle um the conversations 
what's important to them. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody about these things. Well, you're right. You, you know, you, there are, are different, there's like a club, an unofficial club out there. And you can tell when you've met somebody in that club because instead of talking about, oh, I wonder if we're all gonna die of the coronavirus, they're talking about this book they read, they're talking about this, you know, gratitude and abundance. And, you know, it's just like a whole different, it's a whole different vocabulary. And you either have it or you don't, you know. And that's, you're either in the club or you aren't. <laughs> Yeah, and so <clears throat> I think what was amazing for me, and, and I feel thankful for my mom every time I get interviewed and I get to this part of my story, because a lot of times we don't want to admit it, but exposure is everything. It's a lot of things. Yeah. I just finished watching a documentary on Netflix called Babies. Oh, yeah? It was amazing. Like the, but, <clears throat> huh? Well, I was just, you know, thinking what it could be about, you know, how, how, the, like how they evolve and all. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a six part, beautifully, phenomenally done series on babies from when the mother is pregnant with them, um, how they affect the fathers during pregnancy, um, and surprisingly, the fathers are just as happy as the mothers, you know, because they were tested um, for uh, the happy hormone during different stages of the pregnancy, even after the baby was born. <clears throat> and then there's so much research now out about the different stages of the baby and how the baby grows. You know, old scientists used to think that babies grew a quarter of a centimeter every single day and that's not really how they grow they grow in spurts two days no growth and then next thing you know one one night they grew an inch yeah you know so it, <laughs> it was found out to be that they actually grow in stair steps yeah. the sleep cycle how important sleep is to them how important um language is to them and really again why i brought it up <clears throat> how important exposure is to them. One of the uh, couples, and, and, and it was a baby, let's say like a nine-month baby and a four-year-old girl, the, the baby was a boy. But the mother, I think, the mother only spoke English and the father spoke English and French. Yeah. So in the household, Mama only spoke English and Papa only spoke French so that both children would learn both languages. And, you know, you even see in there where <clears throat> the daughter has to sometimes translate to the mother what Papa said in <laughs> French. <clears throat> so I, I thought it was a very interesting um, documentary, but it to me, it just really proved the point of exposure, exposure to just different things where I think that's why people love travel so much because it gives them that exposure to different um, environments, people, culture, food, all of that wrapped into one. Um, but also exposure to, like you said, excuse me, different ways of thinking. And that a lot of times comes from different groups. I mean, how exposed are you if you only go from home to work to home to church to home to grocery store back home to work yeah. you know and you're not a part of any um, professional organization you're not a part of any social club outside of your social economic group right you know because a lot of us are in other extracurricular activities but we around people that only look like us, you yeah. know, only think like us. That's it. No one, um, to, no one to question, no one to challenge your beliefs or your thoughts mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. And or show that. you that there's another way of being. Yeah. And that's what I learned when I was around the investors, because up to then I was around workers 
and entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are uh, lauded workers, <laughs> you know, um, entrepreneurs work harder for what they have employees show up and, and work for what they have. Yeah. But there was this whole other sub, not subset, but a whole other group that were investors that were making money based on decisions alone. Right. Not based on trading time for money, not based on um, making something work, making an idea work. Yeah, none of that. Not not based on punching a time clock, but by lending their money to already successful ideas and companies and getting a return on their money. Yeah. And I just thought that idea was phenomenal. And of course, you know, as a child, sometimes you see something, you're like, how you not see that? I see this. How you not see that? <laughs> <laughs> look, look. Well, you, you don't know, see it, this? But you can see it without realizing that it could be you, you know? And that's where I think mm. some of us bring a lot of baggage to that kind of a, a situation where you, you see someone and you see that they're very successful and you just think, oh, wow, I wish I could be really successful. But you don't say, you know, the question is, what How? do you do to, to find that success and then to emulate it? But, you know, uh, some of us just don't realize that it's within our power to actually <laughs> have that same life? Well, I, I do definitely credit where I am to how I, was, how I was exposed. And I usually tell people that, you know, I think I got it as quickly as I got it, as easily as I got it, because I was a child. <laughs> um, and I didn't have the mental and emotional baggage of an adult to say, Oh, I shouldn't get this. I didn't go to college. Oh, I didn't, you know, study business. Oh, I didn't. And just this whole litany of reasons of why right. exactly. I shouldn't get it. You got it because no one told me that you could. No one told you that you couldn't. <laughs> or then immediately get mad at, at, you know, your parents or somebody else because they didn't teach it to you. It's like. Yeah. Does right. it matter? It's right in front of you right now. When are right. you well, they, and maybe they didn't know it to teach it to you, so you can't really. <laughs> oh, blame that's them. it's almost always they didn't know it to teach to you. Exactly. You know, but um, but yeah, I think when I saw it, and even now I'm in I'm in those environments, and I'm I'm immediately asking the question, how can I do that? Yeah. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be in supportive communities like really BI yeah. um, where everybody's a volunteer and everybody wants you to succeed, you know? And so they freely gave me the information. They showed me how to do it. They walked me how to do, do it. And I'm asking questions like, well, what is PE? Can you explain that again? What is it like this? And, it, and I, I mean, I've been known to take over presentations because I was like asking too many questions <laughs> but um, I just really felt like I needed to get it right and I know one of the things I said in the other interview which is like I saw how hard my mom worked and I didn't want to work that hard Yeah. and it's not that I don't like to work hard it was that I didn't want to be dissatisfied with lo with life or complaining about certain things um, that I felt like if I learned, I probably didn't have to complain about those things. You know, um, like we kind of started the book about, or uh, started the podcast about um, the book Ikigai, right? Because this is the also the other part of my decisions is because I do want a long life. You know, I want to comfortable type of life um yeah i want a, a a certain quality of life and that is evident in the types of choices that i make about where i work how i work type, the type of work i do and and being able to 
make my work money work for me so that I don't have to con- put myself in a bind to go work for it. Yeah. So we, you talked about better investing. Um, I want to just tell folks what it is and how you, how you came and became involved with them. Sure. Uh, better investing is a, a nonprofit organization um, focused on investment education for individuals and investment clubs. And I became involved in, with them through, I believe, the Southeast Florida chapter, which is now renamed as the South Florida chapter. Um, Phil Keating, Ellis Traub, Irvin Roth, um, Adrian Lewis. Louis Adrian, and it's actually his name. Um, you know, these are people, oh, Barb, Dr. Barbara Cobb, these are people that when I was in grade school um, were helping me to learn this stuff when I was showing up to my, you know, monthly CASA classes at Better Investing. <laughs> and then every year um, going to the Better Investing National Conference, a national convention, and just being around these people and reading the magazines at the time when I was growing up, they actually had a, a, a kid slash teenage magazine. Really? That accompanied, mm-hmm, that accompanied the, the, um, the Better Investing magazine. Oh, because if you had a, a youth BI membership, oh, then right. you got the youth publication. And my mom had an adult membership, so she got the, the, the regular BI magazine. And I used to use her bathroom so I used to read both there (laughs) and uh and I just remember reading that type of information and being amazed because kids were being featured you know young adults were being featured about investing and about um going to college I was always gonna go to college but you know seeing somebody closer to your age that were doing it um that are doing it and um and that's how I, I, I became a part of Better Investing, a member of Better Investing. I don't, I don't remember the year. This is something I probably have to find out from Better Investing. But one year uh, we were at the national convention. And um, <laughs> again, this is where math and life skills come in handy. <laughs> so my mom and I are walking down, you know, the little aisles and stuff, and we come across the the bi little booth at the convention and they're talking about the membership right you you, you renew your membership here go to blah 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 they start talking about membership levels so they had a lifetime membership level now the cool thing about a lifetime membership level is that it's lifetime right For me, as a lifetime member, I mean, I was maybe 10 years old, maybe less. So how much is this membership? I have like eight like no more brainer. years to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, if you divide that number by this many of years, and I think, I think the membership was only like $1,000 or it could have been like 700 something dollars. I'm so glad I talked my mama to that because one, they don't even offer lifetime memberships anymore. And you um, got your money's worth already. <laughs> I'm a lifetime member. I mean, what are you going to tell me? I can't get my magazine. I've been knew that was a great investment. I'm like, yeah. I mean, because when you think about it, most of the people that at, especially at that time, they were like 70, 80 years old. Yeah, they got like, maybe young, 10 years out of their membership. <laughs> young was 50. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, you know. Well, that's but, still the case. I mean, more than half the room when you're there is over 60, wouldn't you say? I know, but I think that's why they stopped selling lifetime membership because, <laughs> you know, you, you can't run a, <laughs> <laughs> can't run an operation, you know, on lost <laughs> leaders. So, um, uh, so yeah, that was I, and you know, there just sometimes you realize you think back on your life, you like, you know, that was a good decision. I'm so glad I made that call. Whew. So yeah. <laughs> oh. So I was I have some questions I actually wrote down to ask you. Okay. Um, 
So your introduction to investing, you, is it sort of because you were, when your mom was going through this whole probate situation? Or I mean, how did you actually learn about the fact that there's a stock market and you know, that you can buy stuff and how it all works? Well, I think even, um, even before investing, my mom was, I mean, even before BI, when my mom was going through this situation, she realized that she didn't understand money as well as she thought she did. Yeah. So that's where all of the self-education came. Not to mention she had got got by somebody, you know, she kind of gave them their, her money to invest. Mm-hmm. One of those, we all kind of do it when we don't know any better and when we don't trust ourselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, she never saw that money again. She didn't even know to ask for statements. Oh, wow. Exactly. So oh, wow. Um, she was like, yep, that was a $10,000 learning lesson. I'm like, mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting right there watching like. Hey, oh, glad I got to learn why watching your money disappear. You know, that's how <laughs> I feel. Not my own. <laughs> that's how I feel. You know, because again, like you mentioned on your interview, we all do that. Especially as kids, we're watching what our parents are doing. We're constantly making decisions about how we want our life to be yep. based on what we see. Yep. And so, you know, I was no different. I saw my mom doing certain things and learning certain lessons. And I was like, you know, I don't feel like or believe I need to make that same mistake. Now, it's okay to make other mistakes. But, you know, if you, I think if you look hard enough, and really honest about your observations, you can learn from other people's mistakes and it'll just put you a little bit ahead, you know, um, know where to go, know what to ask. Um, so all that being said, I was a part of a, I think she put me in like a, a kid's finance group, a kid's stock group. And that was how we, I started learning about stocks. Yeah. Um, and then after that group, or even during that group, we found out about better investing. Um, cause I think where we were meeting, there was a better investing meeting in the same venue and we count, we actually happened to just run across it. And, um, and yeah. And so that's how, how I got at this point, you know, I don't have exact dates, but I, all I can say was, oh, I do know. I was in second grade. So seven. I remember my friends. No, second. No, but so you were like seven. Oh, yeah, years yeah. Old, seven, right? seven, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Seven, eight years old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I remember my friends. Addison, I haven't said his name in a long time. <laughs> Elementary school friends. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I was, I was seven, eight at the time. Wow. Second grade. And, and so that was the beginning. Do you remember the first um, stock you bought? That's a story in and of itself. (laughs) I'll get to that story. Okay. So this is the first story. The first story is after my first day, we come home and I go, I get the, I get the newspaper and I, you know, look because in my class, we're able to actually read the stock section of the newspaper. We learned what price was. We learned what, you know, change was, percent change, dollar amount change. We learned what a 52-week high and low was. Uh, we learned what PE was. We learned what earnings per share was. So that's really what the whole line is, you know, if you look. So I go home, and I'm asking my mom for the business section of the newspaper, and then I'm looking at the stocks that I know. And, you know, as, as a kid, I played basketball. So, and I knew all the kids had Nike shoes. I also knew my dad was like, well, we're not buying them shoes unless they go on sale. <laughs> so I went and I looked up Nike stock and I think I remember it being like $72 and something cents. And I was like, damn, a pair of Jordans cost a hundred dollars. You mean to tell me Nike stock costs less than Jordan <laughs> shoes? And my mom was just like looking at me doing all this private eye investigative research, (laughs) saying to herself, I can't even do this. 
And I was just really stunned at the fact that the stock price was this low. I'm asking for the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm asking for shoes. I should be asking for stock. So, <laughs> and then, of course, when you realize what earnings per share really is, you realize that that's how much profit your share is worth. And then when you find out what dividends are, you realize. <laughs> That's how much you get paid for holding the stock. And that shit just did not compare to the Nike shoes. So <laughs> I wasn't getting the shoes anyway. <laughs> it felt like they were so, going to buy know, them you gotta have they're on sale. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to one up on the kids on the, on the playground, you know. You <laughs> quote unquote too poor to be like, I can't get them shoes. You got to be like, oh, I own your shoes. <laughs> I own the store you bought your shoes in. <laughs> you know, you, you a kid. You got to figure your way out. You know, yeah. it's a tough world out here. Can't be no sucker. Yeah, but that's so smart, you know. I mean, and to be, to, to be fair to you, I mean, you're sort of saying, oh, I just got this great education. But a lot of kids, you could have taught them that at seven years old and they still would have wanted the shoes. They wouldn't have seen the bigger picture, you know. You, you know, you had that wisdom even at a really very young age. Well, thank you. I felt like it was just a certain level of hunger, though. You know, like kind of like we talked about not wanting to live in that at, at our parents' house. Like I just I didn't want to be poor. Right. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to struggle like I watch people struggle. You know. Yeah. And um, when I saw, literally saw the way that these investors were living and being in the world, happy, content, yep. looked like they had it yep. versus entrepreneurs always trying to go get it. Right. It was just, I was just like, y'all working too hard. Like, <laughs> Just do what these people do. It. They don't look that stressed <laughs> out like y'all looking like, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, you know, it's 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 interesting because I think I've been thinking recently, I guess, about um, you know, I I watched a documentary on um, Quincy Jones. I watched another one on Miles Davis, and both of them knew, like, in high school that they were going to be playing their instrument, right. you know? Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you really just know, like you knew you really wanted to be in real estate, yeah. you know? Yeah. And as much as I didn't want to admit it, I just knew I wanted to be an investor, Yeah. you know? Um, it just, it just, it just seemed like a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. <laughs> it did. It was, it's just so clear to me, you know? I mean, and again, maybe the age I came at it with or whatever, but to me, I didn't know another way. You know, I wasn't exposed to real estate investing. I wasn't exposed to flipping houses. I was, ex I was exposed to the quote unquote trauma that people feel when they don't have money, yeah. the suffering they go through when they don't have money and the easiness of the people that have it. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's not like my parents was giving me what I wanted anyway, <laughs> you know, <laughs> shit. I, th I thought I was poor. Cause I didn't get this. I didn't get the latest this. I didn't get the latest that. And I was just like, this shit is for the birds. Like <laughs> I got to start stacking my money. Right. But, but, now, when, but, you, but, but now you're not, I don't see you like going out and getting like the, the latest thing and like chasing some kind of fad even now. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it wore off on me. Like yeah. when you realize that that stuff isn't even important. Yeah, you know, um, or you start to actually analyze why are you doing those things? Um, yeah, so I mean, it it, it wasn't. It, yeah, I think even in me being raised by my parents, I learned. Even though I asked for things, I never quote unquote went without. Yeah. Um. 
I found out much later why I wasn't given those things I asked for. And it was because, especially my dad, it was because he valued money in a different way. Yeah. And I, you know, I learned later about that. Like he wasn't about to buy me these shoes or these clothes unless they went on sale. But when I went to Howard, he was not about to let me take out loans. Yeah. Yeah. No, he you just know, had priorities, just different priorities. Yeah. I mean, it took me a long time to realize that, but even though those are other things too, that you're exposed to, because when it happens, a lot of times you're a kid. So you ask why, you know, and sometimes yeah. at the time you don't get sufficient answers. But then when you see it all unfold, you realize, oh, that wasn't his priority. His priority was this. His priority was education or his priority was, you know, providing a certain ease of life and not just racking up material things and then having to work and not spending time with me, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but that's also what I mean about like learning the ways of money. Um, learning the true cost of money and the true cost of certain decisions, yeah. you know? And when I say that, I mean, like two example, two quick examples. If you're buying something on a credit card that you can't afford now, right. even if you bought it on sale, is it really worth that amount? Because it's about, it's about to cost you a lot more than what you originally paid because it's taking you so long to pay it off. And I don't think people think about that when they go to buy that thing, right? you know? Um, and then on, on the other side, like my brother called me and, you know, I was saying, hey, how much is your savings account giving you an interest? And he was like, 0.01%. <laughs> so, so on $10,000, he's making $1.10. Right. Yeah. And I, I literally screenshot him my brokerage account and said, I got the same $10,000 sitting in a money market account that makes 0.06%. And every month I'm making six to $7. Yeah. Every year you're making a dollar. Which is still terrible, but never mind. <laughs> I mean, I mean to have the money sitting there, and let's say it's let's say it's um, it's an emer because what we were really talking about was a savings account, emergency. yeah, an emergency fund. Right. So the money's going to sit there anyway. But do you want it sitting there only making a right. dollar for the whole year, or at least making, you know, yeah. quadruple that every month? Yeah, yeah. You know, so oh, so that go back to your original question. <laughs> My first stock. Oh, well, you know what? That's not really true. I don't I can't remember my memory is slipping me. But one of my very first stocks was Citrix Systems. It's a company here in Fort Lauderdale. And I remember that group that I started out with. We went and we toured it and we was hosted by the CEO and the CFO and the COO in a big boardroom and we're asking questions and you know, we're doing all of this. That's cool. And I go home and I say, hey, Ma, can you buy me some shares of this citrus stock? Isn't it, aren't they the ones that do go to meeting? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Before go to meeting came out. Yeah, but now, yes, this now, was them. now we got Zoom. <laughs> right, exactly. And not even, even more than that, um, at the time, this was like when the U.S. government was bringing an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft because they were getting too big. I think they were trying to buy Citrix at the time. Anyway, that gives you the time frame of it. So, um, so anyway, I asked my mom. She says, okay. Does she buy it? No. I ask again. Does she buy it? No. And that was the story of my life until she goes to buy it and I was like it's beyond the buy rate it's like don't buy it she buys it anyway and then it plummets after that so 
the first lesson was don't wait on your mama. And um, most of the other individual stocks that I had bought after that were through the, um, so Better Investing used to be called NAIC, National Association of Investors Corporation. Um, they had uh, a kind of corporate collaboration agreement partnership with a lot of investor relations departments with a lot of, of uh, Fortune 500 companies to allow people, especially Better Investing members, to buy at least one share of stock through, through what was called a low cost um, direct, direct stock purchase program. And they introduced people to DRIP, um, dividend reinvestment program or dividend reinvestment plan. And, um, and so I bought uh, Pfizer, I bought Home Depot, I bought CVS, I bought um, limited brands that own Limited 2 and Victoria's Secret, Wendy's, and maybe a few others. A lot of consumers. Caterpillar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I got started. That's fun. It's great. That program is great. Did that, does that still exist? That's the whole shame. industry has changed. Every that was kid before. That. That, that was before online brokers. Yeah. Um, and that was when, in the world of investing, you needed to have ten thousand dollars to have a conversation with somebody at Charles Schwab or Merrill Lynch. Yep. Um, oh, do you remember the name of that company? Barney. Barney was it Barney Smith? Barney. Oh, Smith, Smith Barney. Barney. Smith Barney. Yeah. Smith Barney. That was back then. I don't know where Smith Barney is now. Yeah. But, um, either actually it's been a while since i've heard that name it's funny <laughs> it was a whole different world now most companies outsource all of their um stock stuff uh investment related stuff to computer share or am stock or b and y melon um those are the three players and the main players in the game and then you know there's the whole online brokers now. And then even now there are a whole slew of apps that, you know, make investing or buying stocks or even buying fractional shares available to the common man. Yeah. But when we started learning, when I got started, none of that existed. I feel so antique, ancient, <laughs> old. You're dating yourself. I'm dating myself heavy. <laughs> But I mean, you know, that was another one of the things where you do the best with what you had, you know. Um, yeah, it was price prohibitive to, you know, price prohibitive to get into investing, but BI made a way, you know. Um, they, because actually, now that I think about it, their low cost direct stock purchase plan is what apps are doing now. Literally, you would mail a check in to the BI headquarters for the price of one share of stock on that day. Plus, I think uh, I think maybe a ten a ten dollar like transaction um, fee kind of thing. Not transaction, but just in case the price goes up within oh, that oh, range of ten dollars, okay. yeah, and a seven dollar and ninety five cent shipping and handling fee. <laughs> And you send that check in with your form filled out and then they would process it. Next thing you know, you get in stock statements from the company for the exact amount that you gave them. So it either bought a share and a fraction. And next thing you know, every quarter you get in this statement, man, that shit was like gold. I was getting mail as a kid. Yeah. I was voting on board of directors of Kellogg's as a kid. Wow. I wasn't even able to vote in the U.S., <laughs> but I was voting with my stock. Wow. It was like the coolest thing. Yeah. yeah, it's still cool. I think, you know, we, I'm struggling with this with my nephew is how to get him like plugged into that, into that excitement. 
and uh how do you do it how do you get your, i don't know i mean i think that? i think it's like how do you get somebody not to drink as much as we like to parent as much as we like to shelter children in our parenting sometimes you just gotta let them see what a drunk really looks like like stumbling smelling not being able to be trusted not being able to keep a job and be honest is that how you want to end up yeah you know it's no different than us seeing crackheads on the street like you we see it we you know but you but but i still think i mean this is how i made my decision i saw financial ruin and i was like mm, not about to do that yeah. but i've definitely come across a lot of my peers that their parents did everything for them i mean who want to live that right. who want to learn and do for themselves when you've always had somebody to do for you you've never even probably had to think for real or for your own because somebody else was always solving your problems for you yeah yeah so i mean when it comes to how do i get my kids and in, interested i don't know I, I honestly can't say just scare them into it <laughs> I mean, you know, or, or expose them to the joys of it, you know? Yeah. But I'm not for like forcing anybody to do anything. Yeah. Um, I think that if you are in it and they're around you, they're more often than not going to naturally ask you certain questions when it's time and when they're ready. Yeah. You know, um, other than that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll figure it out. So, are you part of an investment club now? No. Oh, I just thought about something, and I—I I mean, I may become—I'm going to become part of an investment club soon because I have to start a model investment club for my chapter, my BI oh. chapter. <laughs> but what I was just going to—I thought about—is how old is your nephew? He's, uh, good question. I think he's now 12. If you get something for him, um, maybe if you can get the statements mailed to him that's and good use idea. that as a talking point. Yeah. Yeah. That's like for idea. my niece who's three, I bought her um, a certain like toddler magazine subscription. So that comes to the house her house with her name on it yeah and she knows that's hers yeah that's a good um, idea because everything's online but i could print it out and mail it to him myself you know yeah or you can have them mail it to him you know uh, yeah i guess. don't know if it's you can get it separated i'll see well i'll see if because he has his own i opened an account for him on folio so i'll see if i can get it and you're and you're the custodial that you're the custodian right for right it? yeah yeah. yeah, just ask him about paper statements mailed to him just for that account, you know, with none of the other accounts. Yeah. And they may, be, they may be able to work it out. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, you're right. That's an excellent idea. Good thinking, because that would be exciting. Then he can watch it change. And then he can be like, Auntie, why do we have this stock? It goes down every month. <laughs> why don't we have this other stock, you know? And yeah. then you can say, well, which one you want? And yep. then you can say, well, where are you going to get the money from? Well, I'll match you. If you come up with something, I'll come up with something. Then you can buy it and have him buy it. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea, too. Because right now, it's just all my money in there. So there's no ownership. There's no ownership. Oh, you're very wise. Very wise. <laughs> yes. So what, what do you think was your most... Is there something that stands out to you as like your most important lesson where you're like, oh, wow. Like that was like a big paradigm shift or that was like a big, if I wouldn't have known that, I don't know. Uh, seeing the, va the, uh, the value of how time value of money and compound interest works together. Yeah. And over a long period of time. What's your um, website that has that chart? Oh, yes. So what I said to Google is Google 
the T H E, the automatic millionaire, time value of money. Okay. All on the same line. Use appropriate spacing, please. <laughs> and press enter. And once you press enter, if you go over to images, it should be the very first image. And you know it's this image because it shows three different people mm -hmm. billy susan and somebody else um and billy starts investing at 15 investing three thousand dollars a year for five years the second person i think her name is susan she invests um three thousand dollars from age 19 to 27 26 27 something like that and then the last person oh, i think her name is kim she invests three thousand dollars from age 27 all the way to 65 and um again billy having started in high school at 15 he invests a total of fifteen thousand dollars only three thousand um dollars for five years and then stops um susan invests a total of twenty four thousand dollars and then stops and then Kim invests a total of one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars, three thousand dollars for every year from age twenty seven to sixty five. And even though Kim put in one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars, they're all earning ten percent a year, which most people don't know. But for the past one hundred years, that's what the S and P five hundred has averaged. So even if they had just put it in the S&P index fund uh, without feeling like they needed to know special magic or not trading or anything mm -hmm. and reinvesting their dividends. Kim investing $117,000 in her lifespan actually phenomenally ends up with $1.2 million. And when you think about it, that's a great return for her money. Um, but not as great as Billy. <laughs> not as great as Billy, who only put in $15,000, but because he put it in so much earlier in life, it had so much more time to grow exponentially. Yeah. Um, and he ends up with $1.6 million. So, the moral of the story is don't beat yourself up if you didn't start early. <laughs> the real point of that example is now is better than later. Yeah. So wherever you are now, if you can consistently start to invest in, I'm going to call them income producing assets, then you will have started your time clock to start you know yeah. working for you yeah having your money work for you um i did i want to share this other example most people don't know about but chris if i said i'll give you a million dollars today or a penny that doubles every day for 31 days which one would you take? The penny. I know this math. <laughs> so this is this reminds me of that fetus that grows. If anybody ever took uh, biology and and had to 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 test X and Y chromosomes and how babies grow, you'll remember that once the sperm hits the egg. Then they like start to split into cells and one turns into two, two turns into four, four turns into 16, and then blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, so with the, with the penny that doubles every day for 30, 30 days, um, by day 29, you would have made a million dollars. And I think by day 30, you would have had two million. And then by day 31, you would have had close to $5 million. 
But again, you had to suffer, like, quote unquote, suffer 28 days before you saw real growth or what you considered was worth it. Yeah. And I think that is um, why a lot of us don't start because we get discouraged in not seeing um, improvement immediately, things taking too slow of a time. Um, but I think, you know, when I was a gardener in D.C., uh, that helped change my relationship to time because um, time is out of your control. Yeah. So that's the first thing to recognize. And then I think the second thing to recognize is there's nothing you can do to stop it. <laughs> so you were a Zen gardener. <laughs> I guess so. I became a Zen. I became a, a Zen meditator when I was gardening. Yeah. But yeah, I was, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, why fight the wave when you can ride it? You know, yeah. time is already going to pass. What are you doing to help you benefit from its passing? Yeah. You know, you can't grow what you never sow, what you never planted, you know, and there's, you can always plant, but of course in growing, there's always better time periods. <laughs> you know, there are certain times to grow tomatoes, to grow watermelon, to grow kale, to grow whatever it is. Um, but you can't start expecting to, to reap the harvest unless you've actually sowed it. And then there's nothing you can do, well, organically really, to speed it up. Right. You know, you just really gotta wait. And the other part about it was you was gonna be waiting anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> My new phrase is the best way to wait is not to move on with your life. <laughs> So, so that's my investment strategy. I invest and I move on with my life. I don't watch it. I don't check it daily. I don't, I mean, this is actually the most plugged in I've ever been because so many quality things are on sale. Right. But I mean, for the past 20 something years, I didn't even used to check my thing more than twice a year. Yeah. You know, I mean. I just, I wasn't ready. It wasn't my thing. I knew it was important to do, but I knew I also didn't have the discipline to be like watching it all the time and, and keeping it there, you know, yeah. cause yeah, you can watch it all the time, but then you feel like I'll be a fool if I don't make a move. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. It's self-control. <laughs> and I don't have it. <laughs> 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 don't snack don't put don't, don't bring the snacks in the house you don't have to snack exactly let's talk about willpower just don't bring it in the house because uh, <laughs> yeah. i know i'm too lazy to go to the store to pick it up <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know how i drink water i don't buy juice i mean simple simple yep. exactly don't complicate things yeah turn laziness into an asset <laughs> you know Thank you. See, you're you're a Zen gardener right there. <laughs> the way of the Tao. Shit. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, what advice besides the fact that everything's on sale and they, people should go buy something? Mm -hmm. I mean, what? So, to me, the secret that I feel like I discovered when I was mm. getting into real estate—I mean, getting into uh, stock investing—was that. You know, there is a seed, there is a time to buy something. It's, you know, there is a wrong time to buy. There is a right time to buy. And um, waiting, waiting until that right time comes along or <clears throat> understanding that, you know, I mean, it's so easy to look at a, a company that you're really interested in buying and thinking, oh, I, you know, the price is never going to be as low as it is right now even though it might not technically be in the buy range. I mean, mm. that's where your Zen gardener comes in, right? Yeah, because I have to use this parable. I don't know who said it. I don't know if it's Jap Japanese, Chinese, it's somebody, ease. <laughs> um, but they say that the best time to plant a tree 
was 20 years ago. <laughs> the next best time is now. Yeah. And I think the timing of the market is the 20 years ago. That is something you learn after you've already walked a mile in your mo moccasins, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's not something, <clears throat> it's like saying, oh, you know, um, when's the best time to work out? Like, should I do morning workout? Should I, should I go to the gym after, after I get off from work? You know, and like, you see this, you see this in the brow? <laughs> this is how you know you're thinking too much about <laughs> exactly. it, right? <laughs> Who gives a shit? Yeah, just get to go the Go work gym. out. Go yeah. work out. You ain't worked out in 20 years. <laughs> Why are you trying to time me now? <laughs> it doesn't even matter right now. Yeah. Go take a walk. Yeah. Go lift a few weights. Go take, do a few laps. Go do a few push-ups. I don't care what time of day you do the damn push up. Yeah. You do a few, see how you feel, do a few the next day, do a few the next day. And after you have started walking, doing, acting, then you can massage it like, mm, I'm going to do them push ups right when I get up in the morning. Mm, I'm going to do them push ups right before I go to bed. <laughs> okay, that's when you start thinking about timing yeah. because we don't know the timing of the market but what we do know is when you wait you miss out on the time so i definitely think that the time is now it's always going to be now if you don't feel comfortable timing it set it up on um automatic um withdrawal from your bank account automatic investment into uh, a mutual fund, an ETF, an index fund, really an index fund, an ETF, because the costs are, are much lower than a mutual yeah. fund. Yeah. Um, but set something up automatically so that you can give yourself credit for doing. And after the doing, continue your education. Start to feel comfortable that you have built up stamina in your doing to then create a strategy. But don't allow not having a strategy to stop you from not doing something yeah. because next thing you know, you're going to be Kim on that graph. <laughs> you, have, you would have waited until the perfect day. And next thing you know, five years have passed. And, that, and that, the other thing about timing five years would have passed without you earning dividends on your money right. outside of how much you pay for it. More often than not, the dividends is going to get you more than if you spent the money on something you didn't need or had it be, um, had it sitting in a savings account, which wasn't giving you any money anyway. Yeah. Not to mention when it's sitting in a savings account, it's not sitting in there. You know why? Somebody else is investing it. <laughs> because the bank has just lent it to your neighbor for its mortgage. And the bank is making 18% on it anyway. So what you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So would that, would that be a, 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 a fair summary of your advice to people is just go freaking do something? <laughs> yeah. Do something. Start small. Invest often. Start small invest often it's not even about trying to master it it's like trying to swim in the ocean well no trying to learn to swim in the ocean that's not the place to try to be learning <laughs> like go swim in a kiddie pool you know or yeah. or a little small swimming pool and then go out to the ocean um yeah start small Keep it often, invest often, because it's, 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 it is about the regular, uh, the routineness of it or the regularity of it. Yeah. You know, that's actually more important than, um, really than anything else. Start early, 
doing it often. Um, I thought about um, kind of like a saying, I, don't, I think I'm making this up and I'm merging two or something like that. But, you know, you don't have to be perfect. And this is a lot of things, but getting a job, being in a relationship. A lot of times if you just keep showing up, you know, you just keep being persistent enough in it. Sorry about the helicopter. Um, <laughs> you're going to get better at it just because you were willing to show up. So I don't want, um, I don't want showing up to be underestimated. So yes, I agree. Um, start early, invest often. Um, focus on taking the steps that you can take instead of feeling beat down for what you don't know. Yeah. Do you have a, any kind of an app or um, anything that you like for investing? Nope. Yeah. yeah any, anything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, to me, investing is, investing is like reading. Um, I did it at seven years old because if, if a seven year old can do it, you can do it. <laughs> uh, there is a, a quote that I literally wrote down last month when I was watching the second season of Luke Cage. And this man said to this other man, if you can't explain the scam to a seven year old, you're probably the one getting scammed. <laughs> So with that being said, once you learn the alphabet, once you learn how to, you know, what sounds each letter makes and then how to chain those sounds together to say words, you've learned the basic of reading. You know how to read. Right. So you can read any word. You have to learn how to read words before you can then start being like, oh, well, what's the definition of that word? Yeah. And that's how I feel about investing. Once you start learning certain, the, the, the fundamental vocabulary, what are the words that we talk about? What is stock? What is share? What is price? What is earnings? What is price slash earnings? What is price <laughs> divided by earnings? What is earnings per share? What is profit? What is sales? What is revenue? Once you can actually recognize those words, have a definition to those words, understand the relationship of those words to each other. Sales usually goes with expenses to give you a profit. Assets usually go with liabilities to show you what the owner's equity is. Dividends usually come from earnings per share what is that relationship once you start learning the relationship of you know these uh vocabulary words and the dance that they do and how they tango and how they switch partners then any stock that comes before you which which is really any company that comes before you you can start asking basic questions how does it make its money how much money does it keep how profitable has it been? Well, how much does it cost right now in relationship to how profitable it has been? Yeah. And then that can then tell you, hmm, am I going to be paying too much for this? Where does paying too much for? What's the two things that are in relationship to each other? Price and earnings. How much am I getting for this stock? Well, what do you mean getting? Dividends is what's paid to you for holding a stock. Like once you know that basic level, then we can start having a conversation around the nuts and bolts of the business. Not the news of the business, not what somebody said about the business, but the business model of the business, the profitability of the business, and ultimately, is it worth your time and money or is it not? Yeah. At least that's how simple, you know, I keep it. Um, but I do think that it's just like, it's just like language. Once you learn how to talk, once you learn how to say words, string those words together in sentences, once you start having a conversation with people, 
then you can start reading between the lines. You can't read between the lines when you don't even know, you know, what the language, what the code is. Yeah. So there are definitely um, building blocks to learning about investing. It's all very simple. I can teach it all in English. You don't have to be scared, <laughs> you know. Um, but it will, it will give you a certain insight on how other people think about money. Because I think a lot of times our relationship with money is go to work to get money, go to the store to give money, go to church to kind of give money, yeah. um, ask people to raise money or to give you money. Yeah. But the idea of actually giving money to somebody to help grow their business or their idea in exchange for more money, that's like a new concept for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So how about, um, will, will you later, when you get a chance, like send me a couple of books or, or you want to just tell me off the top of your head, a couple of books that you recommend for beginners? Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> one book, this talks about the start early, invest often and make it automatic, which is the automatic millionaire by David Bach. Um, my book, which is the baby billionaire's got to investing by Ioni McNeil. Also known, also known as the baby billionaire. Um, stock. I would say even more than a book, using the better investing tools. Mm -hmm. um, they have some really good books that aren't at the top of my head, but um, there's like, I think an investing handbook and um, different things like that. Oh, the Better Investing Magazine. I think that that is a gem yeah. um, because that's like a book, but an article then. Yeah. And um, if you just start reading that, you can get exposed to a lot of this language and start putting a lot of pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of questions you didn't even know you had will start to be answered in this magazine. And um, yeah, I really think that that's the, better investing above all, I think is one of the best places to learn this information. Number one, because they're not benefiting off of you learning from them or you investing with them right you know um so much of financial education is really sales material and people don't realize that that's what it is yeah so um better investing provides a lot of great resources to help you just under understand basic concepts of business and investing um that i i really haven't seen um, put, put better or said, said better, better elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, what should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? What else do you want to share that I, I failed to touch on? Um, I mean, I think this has been wonderful. Uh, uh, let me think. Oh, um, one thing is, I think I, I do want to not all the way share, but just bring to people's attention interest. I talked about a little earlier, um, how much do things really cost? And how much does your ignorance cost? <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to do a, a series, a, 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 a show on that. But anyway, um, that is really just to highlight understanding what interest really means. Mm -hmm. Interest is the price you pay to use someone else's money. Interest also is the price you get paid for somebody using your money. Right. And interest in the form of student debt, credit card debt, mortgage, car payment, business loan, all of that, when you're using somebody else's money, you're paying a certain rate of interest. When you're investing, companies are paying you a certain rate of interest. And I think that's, that's 
that's the best way I can say what investing is mm -hmm. uh, because we are very familiar with being a borrower and dealing with lenders. But I don't think outside of personal relationships of people that ask us for money, we're not used to being a, a, a lender. Right. But just like, you know, if your cousin Paul came up to you and said, hey, can I borrow $20? What's the first thing you're going to do? Well, like, you know, I think the answer that you want is, to, you know, you say, well, what's, you know, what's in it for me? What am I going to, when are you going to pay me back? What's, you know? Yep. You're going to think, what's this person's history? Yep. You're going to look at, just like we look at the history of a stock, what have they been doing yeah. with their money for the past 10 years? Yeah. We're going to run it back. What has Paul been doing with his money? Why, yeah. why is he asking me this for this money? What is he going to use it for? Yeah. Do I support that? Yeah. Is it likely I'm going to get this money back? Yeah. So these are the same questions you literally unconsciously sometimes run in your head about your uh, family member or friend that comes to you asking for money. These are questions you should be run running when you're, um, looking to invest your money in a certain company. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. because you can get an answer to all of those questions. Um, and you can get an answer to them all for free. <laughs> right. So that's, um, I don't know how you would have phrased that question, but that is something that I, I did want to share with yeah. people um, just so that they can realize again, Everything that I say and how I say it is really about realizing how much you already know, yeah. how much you already do these things, have these analyzing methods. Um, you just may not have done it yet with business decisions or investment decisions. But once you can make that connection and correlation, I think it's much easier to do in investing it's much easier to get started. It's much easier to feel confident in your skills. You know, no different than realizing when you worked at a job, you learned certain transferable skills. <laughs> you know, you didn't allow that to stop your career jump from this industry to that industry because you was like, oh, no, sales is sales is sales. Yeah. You know, or operations is operations is operations, whatever industry you're in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just want people to give themselves more credit than they have been um, and feel comfortable with getting started. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. So send me all your info. Send me how they can, people can get the book and I'll put a link on the website, getyourfillpodcast.com. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, Ioni. This has been a real blast for me. I hope other people yes, like to do it as much as too, I like being part of it. <laughs> awesome. All righty. So.